Barry, you posted on Twitter the hashtag AskBarryStark and you've selected some questions today for the fans. A first question today is from Jesse Pugh. Who do you think has the best chance of winning the World Championship? Wow, Jesse, that's one hell of a question. Obviously, anybody that's reached this stage in the competition can, can win the competition. There's no doubt about that. They're all capable of beating each other. Obviously, the bookies, they, they name their favourites. People like Neil Robertson, Ronnie, Sean Murphy, Maguire. These are the people that come through as favourites. But as a young man that I coach, uh, you know, hopefully he will also do very well. But there's one or two of the uh, upcoming Chinese, you know, that are also going to be a force to be reckoned with. So I'm not going to predict anybody. But I will say that, uh, you know, Ronnie O'Sullivan is the best player in the world. I, I, I'm, not, no, I'm not amongst any strangers saying that. Everybody says it. So uh, he's the man to beat for me. Do you think snooker will be dominated by Chinese players within the next 10 years? And that's from Daniela Daniel. Well, certainly the Chinese contingency are coming over in force and they practice awfully hard at the academies over there. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been coaching over there and, uh, you know, you come there, you see these lads there at 10 o'clock in the morning and some of them are there at 10 o'clock at night until the place closes. It's unbelievable the work they put in. Um, particular favourites for me are Yan Bing Tao and uh, Yao Jin Tong. I mean, these are, are, are really up and coming players and they're looking to be, shall we say, the Chinese number one. Obviously, you've still got Ding Jun Wei, who's probably still the Chinese number one. But these two boys are really closing the gap and chasing him very hard. When we look at Chinese in its entirety now, um, the contract that Will Snooker have with uh, Sheffield, I think that was a 10-year contract. It must be into its fifth or sixth year now. So in five or six years' time, that contract will need to be renewed. It may well be with um, Sheffield. I don't know. I'm not in the powers that be. But I can honestly quite see the day where... Uh, Chinese will be put in the bidding and just maybe, I hope I'm wrong, but I hope it stays in Sheffield, but I can see the possibility of the World Championships and other, other major competitions being held in China. I've read somewhere that Ronnie is a big fan of Zhao Zingtong. He's even said sometimes he thinks he can play better than him. That's uh, a, bit of a, a bit of a statement. I disagree with Ronnie. Uh, Zhao Zintong is one heck of a player. There's no doubt about that. But to say he's better than Ronnie, no. No, Ronnie's the best player in the world. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm no hesitation in saying that. I just love the way he hits the ball. Having said that, this Zhao Zintong, he hits the ball very well. I love the casual approach that he's got. A bit, a bit like... Um, uh, uh, Jack Lasowski, uh, uh, they make the game look mm. so easy, you know, and they really are, if you, you know, for a loose term, he's a natural player. He's got that lovely smirk on his face all the time as if he's not under any pressure and he strokes the ball lovely. If he's got a weakness at this level, it's the geometry of the table, you know. Uh, you get you come across players like Mark Shelby. Yes, he can match them in break building in potting. Can he match them in the geometry side of the game? You know, the tactical side of the game. There's not many can match Mark Selby or John Higgins in that department. So maybe he lacks a little bit of experience there and that would be possibly his only weakness. Do you think it's about confidence? Because I'm sure when his confidence is sky high, he can pot anything. It always intrigues me, you know, when a player has made a break and he's won the frame. Yeah, and they start coming out with the exhibition shots, a bit like Judd Trump. They just point the cue and hit the ball in. They just know it's going in. If you can adopt that attitude in the early stages of a match, then you're going to be a force to be reckoned with. I think Steve Davis put it very well some time ago when he said, if you can play as though it means nothing, when it actually means everything, then you're going to be hard to beat. This next question is from Red Black Snooker. Hi Barry, huge fan here. 
How much do you think the visuals tell about a player's technique? Some can keep their cue action still under pressure, even though they don't have the best looking technique. What aspects should a player focus on? Mm, good question. I think the first thing to say on that is that if a player looks good on the shot, he looks comfortable, and then invariably he is pretty good. If somebody's got a poor technique, um, you're going to see the, the weakness straight away and he's not going to be a great player. There are exceptions to that rule, of course there are. I look at people like Judd Trump who goes across the board or aims to, as though he's going to miss and then he, he moves and somehow he delivers that cue online. I, I compare that with Mark Allen who's, who uses a lot of wrist and he hardly moves the cue going backwards and forwards and yet one heck of a player. So you look at those two aspects and you say, what works for the player, leave it alone. If it isn't broken, don't fix it. But I do like to see people like um, Ronnie, obviously, uh, Judd Trump, um, sorry, uh, Neil Robertson, Kyron. They've got this pre-shot routine that is repeated in practice and then they take it to the matches. Uh, these, for me, are, are the players that are physically strong, in their technique, and once they've got that established, they start to become mentally strong as well. The two go hand in hand. You can't divorce one from the other. I've got a question from Edwin Ingebrigtsen from Eurosport. How long should a cue be? I see that some players grip the cue well inside, like Higgins, but others grip at the very end on almost every shot. What's the perfect cue length? <laughs> There isn't one. Okay. <laughs> the standard length of a cue is 58 inches, right? My cue is 57 inches, right? I'm, I'm quite a short person with short limbs, right? Well, if you're really tall. Sorry? <laughs> if you're really tall, if, then... Yeah. If I look at Kyron, who's well over six foot, uh, it would be silly to have, for him to have a cue 57 inches long. So it's a little <laughs> bit longer. John Higgins is quite short. Uh, he's not a big fella by any means, so he'll have short limbs. Um, I, I look at Kyron and I've often pulled his leg. You know, your arms are that long, you've been swinging from the trees. You know, but we have a laugh about that. But he needs a longer cue than a short person. It's as simple as that. Uh, if we come back to John Higgins, and I, I don't want to pick on individuals, or, you know, highlight what they do and what, why they do it, but I do know that John Higgins has moved his, his bridge hand closer to the cue ball. Well, you have a relationship between the two hands, your bridge hand and where you hold the cue. And if you move one, then it's not a bad idea to move the other one and keep that relationship the same. So John Higgins has moved his bridge hand closer, so his, his grip hand has moved forward as well. The relationship between the two hands is pretty much the same, but it means that he's got more of the cue overhanging. Now, in theory, he could shorten his cue and still be, you know, okay with it. But he likes the length of cue, he likes the balance, because don't forget, if you alter um, the length of the cue, then sometimes you can affect the balance as well. Some people like a butt-heavy cue, others like a, a forward-leaning cue. You know, it's an individual thing. But the length of the cue, up to a point, depends on the length of your arms and your body structure. Barry, how do you increase confidence when playing against an opponent? When I'm down on the shot, even an easy one, I feel like I'm not 100% sure I'm going to pot it. Colin Z. We all go through these periods where negativity creeps in and you're doubting your own ability. I come back to the, I, I, I'll say it time and time again, come back to that pre-shot routine. If you can establish it in practice, there's no reason why you can't do it in matches. Now, obviously, there's more to it than that. But if you can get in practice and you point that cue and you do what you always do and invariably the ball goes in, then you've got a better chance of taking that to your matches and becoming mentally strong. Does it matter if there's nobody watching or if there's 10,000 people watching or if the cameras are there? I point the cue, do what I always do, and the ball goes in, you will increase your mental strength. The other side of that is the mentality, you know, where, you know, your heart might start racing and things like that. I mean, if you look at Ronnie O'Sullivan, Ronnie O'Sullivan keeps himself fit, right? So 
his heart rate is lower than somebody who's unfit. Mm -hmm. You know, so if if the resting heart rate of a shall we say a male male adult adult is around seventy seventy two beats a minute, but you get an athlete who's running regular, that his resting pulse rate will be probably below sixties. You know, so now he's, he's he gets under stress and his heart rate goes up, but it don't even reach the seventy seventy two of the normal man. So it's it's not under so much pressure. You've got the oxygen into the bloodstream. It the oxygen feeds the brain. You're thinking better. You're reacting better. Your physicality is better. If all that balance is right, then mentally you're going to be better. And I've always believed you cannot divorce the two. You know, the physical side of it and the mental side, they go hand in hand. If you're weak in one, you're going to be weak in the other. If you're strong in in one, you've got a better chance of being strong in the other. There are a lot of tournaments these days where they only have the best of seven. Do you think this suits some players when comparing it to the longer frame format? And do you like these different formats? That's from Phil C. Yes, is a short answer to that. There is a big, big difference. Uh, we've got to remember that we're in the in the line of entertainment, you know. So people, I mean, it's like the the shootout. The, the crowds there, they love the one one frame shootout, and anybody can win it. Okay, the, the real professionals say, well, it's a bit Mickey Mouse snooker. Yeah, but it's an entertainment. Um, when you get to the longer frames, like the best of 19 in the World Championship, invariably the better player is going to come through. But when you get to the best of sevens in the early stages of some tournaments, then, yeah, uh, you get the lower ranked professional who can knock a long pot in and make 50. Yeah, straight away, I don't care if it's number one, he's sat down watching and he's struggling to win that frame. You know, and if you can get two frames a start there in the best of seven, you've got one heck of a chance of winning and going through to the next round. Not always so in the longer format, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I've often seen the top player two, three frames down, but then they start to get going and, and you know, and eventually they come through. Basically, because at the end of the day, they're the better player. You've got players like John Higgins who are renowned for, you know, clearing up from behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, John Higgins is mentally strong. That's point one. Mm -hmm. And his mental strength, for me, comes from the physical routine that he does. Kyron Wilson, mentally strong. You know, they call him the warrior. And they call him the warrior for a reason. Do you think Kyron suits the longer frame format? Oh, yes, very much so. You know, he loves it. You know, he's good at both forms, let's be mm -hmm. honest as most of them are. They're still good at it, but you know, the better player, they like the longer format, of course they do, yes. Barry, I've got a final observation from me. I've noticed on your YouTube channel, the 147 video is missing. Mm -hmm. What's going on with that? Well, that's quite deliberate, to be honest. You know, um, we wanted to do something special. In fact, you know, fans were asking us to do so something special. So we're expecting something special. Then. Yeah, yeah, they were expecting it. And the truth is, if they're waiting for me to do a 147, <laughs> they're going to be waiting a long time. Uh, my days of doing 147s have gone. It's taken me 30 years to have two 147s, and they weren't on these tables. They were on club tables with backs like buckets, right? So making a 147 is very, very difficult. Yeah, that's point one. That's why I resorted to, to coaching. I've had a teaching background and that's where my, my, I like to think where my strength is. What I was hoping for with this 147, I'm not going to pull any punches on this. because okay. <laughs> I'm sure he'll forgive me. Taylor Wilson, Kyron's brother, yeah, I've been asking him to film Kyron in practice doing a 147. Now, Kyron usually makes two or three a week, at least. I've known him make three in a day. Right? And each time Kyron has made one, Taylor, Kyron's brother, has uh, forgotten to film it for me. Because the intention was to film the 147 and then was to upload it with the comments from me as to why he's played this shot uh, and the eventual outcome. Uh, I've yet to get this to this video, in fact, I keep kicking uh, young Taylor's backside to say, do not forget to film Kyron in practice for me. <laughs> Up to this time, he's let me down, but I'm confident it will come. Please be patient. <laughs> <laughs> so how long, I'm not quite sure.